right off the bat, uh, I know we're on the phone, but I, I want to get in the, the right the, the right mood. Are you? Can you please tell me if you're wearing an Alamo Draft House shirt? Uh, I am not. I'm I'm only wearing a, a Toxic Avenger shirt. So okay, okay. my apologies. Not a problem. And what's the facial hair situation like? Uh, you know what? It's actually I am pretty well shaven at the moment. Uh, I had to. I had a, a, a big interview on Friday, and I thought, you know what? I'm probably better off if I look somewhat mature. Yes. So, uh, sh- you know, shaved it. But it, it, it's I'm like Homer Simpson, where I'll shave it, and it'll come back within minutes. Yeah. So, it's, I, I'd say I'm, I'm cultivating a nice little scruff. Gotcha, man. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, I watched the film. Great movie all the way through. Oh, thank you. Had a blast. Thanks. I didn't watch it on my computer. I actually watched it on a large... 55 inch TV, surround sound, had a great Perfect. had a great time. So, oh, that's awesome. For the people going into the the movie kind of blind, which which I did, I, I didn't do any research. I kind of just wanted to jump into it. What would you say are the the prerequisites for for mayhem? So like for uh, for like for Wrong Turn two, I mean, you could say like obviously Wrong Turn or The Hills Have Eyes, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What you got? Have a bad day at work. That's probably the best prerequisite. Okay. It's like if you've ever had a really shitty day at work, or you don't like that, the, you know, that coworker or that boss, or you're generally just in a bad place work-wise. I can pretty much guarantee that for the next eighty-seven to ninety minutes, that you'll not think about that job, or, or at the very least, you will, and you'll be able to kind of purge any violent urges that you may you may have out there. Um, yeah, this this movie is it's one of those things that I, I didn't I underestimated how people would relate to it um, because I think it was just so personal for me because I related to the script when I read it because I was working a corporate job at the time between movies and it was just something that I was not happy in and I just didn't see myself doing anything good it wasn't creative like I you know like my other endeavors that I've had it just it was making ends meet. So I got out a lot of demons with this movie and I just never thought since, you know, we've been, we've been um, screening the movie at festivals since March and we've done a ton of them. And I think we've won like five or six audience awards at that, at, at this point. So wow. clearly this movie is kind of connecting with people. And what I usually do before the screenings, I always like have people with a show of hands say like, you know, who is or has worked a corporate job before? And, I was shocked every time that we've done it. I'm shocked that more than half the room raises their hand. And I think it's just one of those things where if you need a prerequisite for going into mayhem, you know, other than if you love Stephen Young from The Walking Dead or if you love Samara Weaving or if you can tolerate my work or whatever, I think it's more like if you've, you know, if you're, if you're having a bad day and you come home and you want to crack open a beer or if you just want to grab that glass of wine and put the kids to bed and watch something where you can feel like, oh, somebody gets me and also, fuck yes, yeah. and this is your movie. Well, I definitely can relate to that and I, I, and I felt that way throughout the movie and I think that's what allowed me to continue like i wasn't exactly connecting to the main character based on the situations that i've been in but i could definitely see the transition throughout and i I, the vibe that i got was more of like a game of death uh and i got a lot of like have you seen you've seen that movie raise with oh of course i what's really funny is that like i didn't have too many movies that i used as um references in this one you would usually like i can I can go like, oh yeah, you know, Wrong Turn Two is, uh, you know, The Hills Have Eyes meets Evil Dead Two, or yeah. Nights of Bad Aston is The Goonies for Grown Ups, or Everly is uh, Die Hard in a Room. Like there was always that that kind of movie marketing way of being able to uh, condense your movie into other movies that people know that they can kind of go like, oh yeah, that sounds good. Um, here, the only movies that I kind of referenced at all were maybe uh, A Clockwork Orange or uh, Wolf of Wall Street. But what's funny is that when Stephen Young and I first met, he was talking about how much this reminded him of Game of Death. And I'm like, dude, oh my God, it, like, it totally made me go, like, oh my God, this is Game of Death. Yeah. And that, like, that was our first conversation. And not that we forgot about it, but it just, it, it 
it wasn't something that I put on like every email afterwards where it's like, and remember, this movie's like Game of Death. Not at all. Yeah. So one character moment that I really wanted to kind of infuse in the film is that, you know, we try so hard to personalize our work experience for better or for worse, you know, like it's anything that makes us feel like we're not just a cog in the system. And a lot of times, especially like where, where I worked, it seemed like the only thing that anyone could really do to make it feel like they had any personality in the office was their coffee mug. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to kind of make that, co that coffee cup that Derek had a character or at least have an arc of some sort or at least be, you know, the, the MacGuffin, if you will. Like there was just something about this coffee cup that was like the last vestige of Derek's humanity. So from the beginning, I, like I remember after our first meeting, I'm like, all right, what's that coffee cup going to be? And Steven's like, let me think about it. So back and forth, we went so many different ideas and so many different iterations, I think to the point where we just kind of got sick of it and we're just like, ah, whatever, like whatever. And at the last minute, Steven sent me this, this like very basic design and I looked at it and I went, oh my God, it's, it's Bruce Lee's outfit from Game of Death. So essentially, we are tipping our hat to Game of Death every time Derek uh, looks at his mug. So that that's really where like our, our hat tip is. Um, what's also funny is that movie Rays, um, I, I which I really dug. Uh, I was such a big fan of Zoe's, you know, from Death Proof, obviously, and yeah. the other movies that she's done, and she's just so amazingly kick ass. Uh, we were really close to casting her in uh, in Mayhem as well. And it just ended up being, I think, I think she ended up having to go like do Thor or something like that. So it's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pass and I'm not going to make anybody pass a Marvel money for my dinky little movie <laughs> in Serbia. So we were close and, and I hope to work with her someday. But like, I, I remember watching that movie again because we were, we were meeting and, uh, and I remembered how brutal that film can be at times. I think I even took a couple notes on like, wow. You know, even on a very low budget and even with a, you know, very high concept, this movie gets a lot of mileage out of out of the violence. And it was definitely something that I remembered when I was kind of uh, infusing my own violence into the scene. Well, that, that's just such a crazy coincidence that those two connections. I didn't make the connection with the coffee cup, but I, since we're talking about it, I do have to say that the device of the coffee cup I really liked because it, it definitely humanized the the characters and i de i really really appreciated that so i'm glad glad that uh the evolution of the copy cup worked its way into the film as well um it's just one of those things that like i think i, I had my own coffee mug and i held it uh, held onto it for dear life yeah. like this is all i have left of my own sanity and humanity so th to be able to like make a coffee cup be the you know this kind of symbol in a way yeah. without also making a huge meal out of it too is is so much fun I, I i like when we've screened the movie uh with audiences and stuff like that and to hear everybody go like oh when the coffee mug gets like gets shattered i'm like it's a fucking mug yeah it's you know like and people are lamenting it like it like it like it was a, a supporting character in the movie and i'm like <laughs> it kind of is in a way that's yeah. that's pretty freaking cool so you mentioned all of the uh the festival love you guys are getting uh i'm i'm curious because in the past you have toured some of your films what kept you from touring or like piggybacking onto like adams victor crowley or like why didn't you take this and tour this one as well well first off we we had a deal set with um uh both, both rlj and shutter like once we played it um south by southwest there was a lot of bidders and there was a lot of people who saw the potential in it doing theaters and doing something wider so it was more just like politics than anything else. Oh. Um, we also knew that, you know, the movie, after it played at South by, it went from no one knowing about the movie to everybody wanting to show it, which was such an honor. Like I was, I was so, um, I was so floored by that. It was so, like very, very much, uh, it was a lot of great, you know, um, what's the word? Um, not gratuitous. Gratitude. There was a lot of gratitude. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of gratuitous gratitude involved <laughs> when, when, when people started to uh, recognize that the movie played really well. So it almost felt like I, I would probably do just as well if we did it where it felt like there were festival wreaths involved and there was the, po the, the slim possibility of, of winning any awards. Because like, when, I, when I look at movies to watch, I got to admit, like when I see those festival wreaths, 
it does attract me to it. And it does make me, you know, and, and if I've heard that a movie has played at festivals and played well at festivals, I mean, that's kind of how everyone first found out about It Follows yep. and The Babadook. And there's, I mean, I can name a ton of movies that have all, you know, Green Room, Blue Ruin, you know, like all those movies enjoyed a, a, a lengthy little run doing the festivals and it just kind of added to the cachet of respectability. So, and that's really what I wanted, knowing what this movie was and how particular it was. It felt like the best thing that we could do because we, we weren't an established IP other than, you know, Steven and Samara. I mean, I mean, the two people that know my work, it wasn't Victor Crowley. You know, Victor Crowley is an icon, yeah. you know, so Adam could go around the country and just say like, hey, want to see a new Victor Crowley movie? And nine times out of ten, someone's going to go, F yes. You know, whereas I'm like, hey, remember Glenn? Glenn who? Oh, yeah, obviously not a Walking Dead fan. Yeah, kind of. And then we get into a long conversation and they end up not in the moments <laughs> of the movie. So here, it's like the festivals allowed me to have a, a bit of a, a limited theatrical kind of touring run and, and in a way that was, you know, was well promoted each time and, you know, the opportunities to be able to go to these different theaters and see the movie. I mean, I technically got to test, test screen my movie in like 15 different markets yeah and each each audience was different and i mean thankfully the, you know in, mo in, in most cases if not all the cases the, the the reactions were incredibly positive i mean that's the thing that i'm kind of most nervous about with the movie coming out this week is that most of the reviews are gonna, that are going to come out this week are from reviewers that are seeing it on a screener instead of watching it um with an audience and the reviews that came out that we got um from the festivals from people actually going to a theater and watching it with an audience on a big screen with the good sound, it's a different beast. It really is. And like, and, and there's nothing I can control with that, yeah. you know? And of course, like, like every filmmaker, we want all of our movies to be seen on the big screen. But this, this movie was designed to be a crowd pleaser. This was designed to be something that you could see on the big screen with a bunch of your friends and with a crowd of people that you might not know and enjoy like a roller coaster. You know, like we, when we get on a roller coaster, there's a difference sometimes when you're doing it where you watch a YouTube video and you're like, whoa, crazy. And then when you're in the seat in, you know, in one of those carts and it's even more different when you're by yourself on that track, which I've done before with roller coasters where you end up being like the only person on there or like the only two people on there from one reason or another. And it's like, yay, but there's something different about when you have a bunch of people in front of you or behind you or both screaming and yelling as you do, it fuels the audience experience. So now that the movie's coming out and like now that's going to be a bunch of people who are both registered on Rotten Tomatoes but also uh, will not go see this movie in theaters, I'm, I'm very curious to see what their reaction is like because it's just one of those films that I think needs an audience to really appreciate what we were going for because I think people can relate to it and, and it's, it's begging you to like scream and yell and shout at the screen and stuff because we, and we saw it over and over when we were going to the festivals like and i really underestimated that that whole idea because i thought at that point when we first screened it at south by i thought my career was done like i just got so close to the movie and i was so jaded from it just because we had to do so much of the effects work and so much color work that you just get you lose perspective yeah and it it took the first five minutes for the like for me to realize that the audience was connecting for me to finally like relax and go oh okay and then just seeing the response and hearing the laughter and hearing the cheers both in the middle and the end of the movie like when, when every every time a boss got killed uh you know more times than not people would cheer and it was just like wow either this movie is really connecting to an audience or there's some sick fuckers out there who <laughs> have a, a real grudge against their bosses or both who knows yeah um so so yeah i mean it, it's it was great that we did the festivals you know who knows there, there's also been talk that we've been we would do special screenings of the movie after the the initial theatrical re release because you know the, the, that that release is going to be a week or two weeks or whatever mm -hmm. and then it's not going to it's not going to have the same impact that it will ever again you know but there have been a lot of places that, you know, recently that have been like, hey, would you mind coming here? Would you mind coming there? And I'm like, sounds great. Any chance to be able to get to see this with a crowd on a big screen? I'm taking that opportunity. Yeah. Your, your analogy with the roller coaster made me think. The, the film was shot in Syria. So, I mean, keeping that in mind, like, 
you guys are pretty secluded, correct? Like you the and the team. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's actually Serbia. If it, it was Serbia, Syria, yeah, I, I, um, think, I think it would have been a completely different movie. Yeah, I, well, thank God. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no, 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 it's it's funny. I'm, I, for a second, I'm like, we shot it in Syria? What the <laughs> fuck? Holy crap. But no, no, we shot... Um, this was actually my second film that I shot in uh, in Serbia. The, the first one was the last movie that I had done, Everly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at first it was purely for financial reasons, purely for the tax break and everything, and... And this time, it was that. There was definitely that factor was involved in the decision-making. But this time, I got to go back and work with all these amazing artisans that I had worked with on Everly. And I like the, the biggest takeaway that I had from Everly was, holy crap, the, the local crews and the local cast in, in Belgrade are second to none. They're amazing, and they love making movies and they love doing tv they just they love being in the entertainment business yeah whether it's you know in an executive thing or an actor or a grip or art department or whatever like you don't get those jobs come very often where you're you're making decisions and you're creating things that people around the world are going to see that's awesome so that very appreciative audience was something that i really appreciated myself because I, I i feel the same way i'm i'm the guy who's like I might never get a chance to make a movie again, so I might as well put all of my work into it now because this might be it. So to be able to go back to Serbia, it wasn't uh, it wasn't my my wife's and my family's favorite decision, and nor was it my decision to go like, oh, I want to be away from my family for six months, but thank God for Skype and FaceTime. Yeah. But I I got so much more out of going to Serbia and making the movie there, and to be able to work again with people that I truly call family my like my my film family it was I, the movie wouldn't be the same without them you know i i don't know if i would have been able to even make the the movie that we ended up making without that crew and without the the people that were there so and would i go back and do it again absolutely but this time and i even have a movie that i'm, I'm planning now that would be kind of like the third in my serbian film trilogy <laughs> and no i'm not remake i'm not remaking a serbian oh uh, come on but, man but close i will say that the, the the film that I am developing to shoot there would actually uh, shit I'm giving too much away nah screw it. it it definitely has the same kind of vibe as that uh, but but in this case it would actually be going to Serbia and shooting Serbia for Serbia not shooting Serbia for New York or not shooting Serbia for any town USA like we did with Mayhem mm -hmm. it would actually be kind of incorporating Serbia too so. That would be thrilling because I'm sure everyone would be like, "Yes, we don't have to look like Americans anymore." Thank God. Yeah, I, I was curious about that uh, as well. Um, the, is the movie you're referring to the one that you're working on now? Is that is that the movie Taste? No, no, no. Okay. That one's going to be shot in the states. Okay. Uh, that, and I don't know if we would be able to make that movie in Serbia. Uh, who knows? Okay. Check, check with me in six months when they're like, "We got a great tax break for Serbia." I'll be like, "See, it. I'm gonna, gonna go there." Uh, no, this is something. Uh, this is something else that I'm doing, but I, I can't quite talk about it yet. But I'm really, really excited about it because it's. Uh, I will say this: it's a remake, gotcha. and I'm not a big fan of of. Uh, depending on the remake, like I, I encourage remakes when the the movie feels like it was not completely embraced when it first came out, so it's not something as universally loved that's going to be scrutinized as much, or. It's a movie that like had great ideas, but I didn't feel like I, I you know like I could bring something different to the table and mm -hmm. something that that I feel would even be better and, and more significant. So this movie is kind of both in a way, where it's a movie that I feel no one no one I know every time I bring it up, very few people know what it is, which is great. It's not like I'm going like I'm remaking Halloween, and you're just <laughs> like oh boy, there we go, you know. And also, it's something where I go, I remember seeing it and loving it. But there were things that I would do differently. Yeah. So here, here it is. I get to kind of have my cake and eat it too. And if I have my druthers, uh, it'll be set in Serbia, which is really cool. That is, man. I've I've seen like you have me very, very excited now. Especially like I had no idea that this would come out of this. But I, I'm I've seen almost all of your work. Uh, Truth and journalism. What up, man? Oh, thank you. Uh, what would you say is your is your director trademark? And do you think that Mayhem captures that? Like, would you say that that, that is one of the ones that kind of highlights you as a director, or do you have a one of your other films in mind? You know, I, I can easily say that Mayhem is my most personal movie, 
And Good. that that's without a doubt. That that's because you know, I lived what Derek went through in, in, to a certain degree. Uh, maybe the first act. Um, I've be, I've been in his shoes, so I felt like where I uh, you know in in movies past I've I've been using you know the the history of cinema or my selective love of certain movies as my driving force. You know, it's like oh my God, I would love to do this kind of moment and that kind of moment and all that. Here was like the first time where I was able to kind of tap into my own life and my own struggles and my own emotions to be able to kind of inject the movie with with resonance. And that that's where I would say like Mayhem is probably the, the film I'm most proud of. Although I up until this point, like truth and journalism is really one of my my most beloved and, and like proud kind of projects because it was made for less than no money and it was made uh, you know with an ip and with characters that i truly adore between venom and the man bites dog movie Mm -hmm. you know those are two things i hold very dear you know in in my own love for cinema and comics and the way that it all kind of came together and working with ryan again and you know working with the effects team on, on creating venom you know all these things it was a perfect storm of creativity that i just I cherish, like, I, I look at that movie, and every everything that I've done, and we all do this as filmmakers, we all go like, oh, God, I could have done this, and I could have had that. You could be like Oscar Schindler at the end of, of Schindler's List, where you're like, I could, I could have had one more day, and I could have done this differently. Whereas with, with Truth and Journalism, I think the, because the bar was set so low, and because we basically made that movie purely on passion and favors, and people just loving and investing in, in us and, and this weird concept, I think people, like, to me, I feel like it's something that I made out of literally nothing, and there, I didn't have any compromises other than the usual of time and money, um, you know, people trusted me, and we, we made this thing just purely out of love, and, and that's kind of what it's all about a lot of ways, you know, sometimes if you're lucky, you get paid, sometimes if you're really lucky, it pays you back, a lot of times it doesn't. But here was something where it was like it was one for me and one for the fans of all, you know those movies and that comic book, and that's where some that's where I go. I I did I did right. Yeah, basically with whenever I'm introducing someone like to you as like a, a voice or an artist, that's that's where I begin. Uh, just because I love I love I just love everything about it. It's it's uh it's very polished and, and beautiful. So that, oh thank you thank you for that. Um, I know that there's some time between now and the home video release, but I was told to tell you to make sure that when Mayhem comes out, that you have one of those lenticular covers. So for the sole, oh, for the sole purpose, no. So you can rub your fingers no. across it. Never, 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 ever. Well, who who told you that? Did fucking Green tell you that? Yeah, he did. Hold on. And it's Jesse, right? Yeah, Jesse. I met him in Houston. Hey, Jesse. I mean, uh, hey, Adam. So Jesse from Houston told me that he really hopes that the DVD box for Mayhem has a lenticular uh, cover on it. <laughs> Fuck you, asshole. You dick. Yeah, he thought that was real funny. Thanks, uh-huh. man. Oh, Thank you asshole. for that. Uh, oh, no, my pleasure. Believe me. Um, I got to run, unfortunately. I got this uh, next one to do. No um, problem. Was, um, there, was there anything else? Yeah, before I let you go, two years ago, you guys read my Halloween movie list on the Movie Crypt. Uh, I met Adam last month, and I'm talking to you now. Uh, this has been, like, the month of months, basically, and I just wanted to end the conversation by saying thank you. And Oh, dude, you, thank you. That's awesome. You and, and your podcast and your work, they're, they're truly inspiring, and uh, I look forward to everything else you have coming up, man. So good luck. Oh, uh, thank you. Jesse, thank you so much, man. That really means the world to us. Even though you had to bring up the lenticular thing, ugh. but other than that, you're a good people. And thank you for getting the word out because you know between the the podcast and the movies and everything, it's like we we kind of live with word of mouth. And and the more people can kind of get that word out, the better. And you know, we we do the podcast because we love you guys and we love kind of bearing our souls and stuff like that and bearing other people's souls for the good of the, you know, the art, not just for commerce and shit. Yes, so sir. thank you. That, that means a lot to us. All right, excellent, man. Thank you so much. And, uh, we'll talk to you later. All right, Jesse, have a good one. You too. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.